Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order. If you'll please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Commissioner Sicklin will lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the uh, Planning and Housing Commission meeting. Uh, we'll open up with uh, any oral communications from the public. Persons wishing to address the Planning and Housing Commission are requested to state their name for the record. This portion of the agenda is intended for public comment. 
State law prohibits the Planning and Housing Commission from discussing or taking action on items that are not listed on the agenda. The Planning and Housing Commission would appreciate your cooperation in keeping your comments brief. And I have speaker cards, but they're for the actual agenda items. So if there's no one else who'd like to speak, we'll go ahead and move on to the meeting minutes. The I'd be asking for approval of the minutes and thank you Ms. Kilman for the 15 pages of minutes from the marathon meeting on uh, February 24th 2020. Do I have a motion for approval? A motion to approve. And a second. I'll second. A second please vote. All right, that passes 4-0. And we don't have any consent items, so we'll move on to the public hearing. Public hearings are items that have been publicly advertised to review and consideration by the Planning and Housing Commission. There are four public hearings tonight, um, basically one applicant with um, CZ 16-002, TTM 363, correction, 36608, TTM 36605 and V2019-001 for the properties located east and west sides of Lincoln Avenue, north of High Grove. Applicant is David Claudone and Fontana San, is it Savain? Uh, I'll see. Ms. Yang, would you go ahead and present, please? Thank you. Thank you. So as you said earlier, the project site is located on the east and west sides of Lincoln Avenue and north of High Grove Street. So the project site is actually comprised of two parcels. Um, one parcel is 1.4 acres and the other is six acres. The smaller parcel is on the west side and the bigger parcel is on the east side. The applicant is proposing a subdivision of 28 total lots on both parcels. Five lots are proposed on the west side, 23 on the east side. Um, the surrounding area is primarily residential. There is a kin and care that's directly south of the project site at the corner of Lincoln and High Grove. Four applications are being reviewed tonight. Um, Two of the applications are the tentative track maps that are associated with the subdivision of the two sites. A third application is a variance, which is associated with the 1.4 acre site. And then the fourth application is a change of zone, which is associated with the larger parcel. This is the zoning map of the project sites to give you a view of what the two parcels are currently zoned for, as well as the surrounding area. The smaller parcel on the west side is currently zoned R17.2. And that allows for the subdivision of single family lots that have a minimum lot size of 7,200 square feet. On the east side, that bigger parcel is currently zoned agricultural and requires a change zone. The applicant is proposing a zoning of R17.2 to also allow for single family lots that have a minimum lot size of 7,200 square feet. And that zoning would be consistent with the zoning that is currently established to uh, established to the north of the project site. This is the general plan map that shows how the project site and surrounding area are currently designated. So the one on the west side, the smaller parcel that is currently designated low density residential on our general plan map, and that allows for a maximum of six dwelling units per acre. The parcel on the east side that is currently designated, designated low medium density residential, and that allows for a slightly higher density um, at eight dwelling units per acre maximum. The development that are being proposed on both sites are well below the maximum allowable densities that are being prescribed for each site under the general plan. This is the layout of the map that's being proposed for the five lots on the west side of Lincoln Avenue. 
Again, this is the site that is currently zoned R17.2 already, and that allows for the subdivision of single family lots with a minimum lot size of 7,200 square feet. The lots that are on this side of the project site range from eight from about 8,300 square feet to over 10,000 square feet with an average lot size of 9,399 square feet. All the lots are designed to take access off of Waterfall Lane, which is a street that's located along the west perimeter of this track. This track is associated with a variance, and the applicant is requesting a variance to allow for lot five to reduce the lot death requirement from 100 feet to 91 feet. And the reason for this is because the project site, as you can see, it tapers on the southern end of the, of the of property, and that's where lot five is located. And the reason why the site tapers on the southern end is because of the, of the alignment of Lincoln Avenue. This is the layout of the map that's on the east side of Lincoln Avenue. This is the six acre parcel. The applicant is proposing 23 lots on this side. The lots range from about 8,300 square feet to over 10,000 square feet and the average lot size is 8,221 square feet. The applicant is essentially trying to finish off this block. He'll be bringing in the two existing streets that are located in the track to the north and to the project site. Those two streets will connect to a new street, which will outlet onto Montoya Drive. All the lots are oriented towards the internal streets, so none of the lots will take access off of Montoya, High Grove, or Lincoln. The applicant is required to construct all missing public improvements within the streets that are adjacent to the project site. In addition, the applicant is also required to extend the sidewalk from the five lot track um, to connect to existing sidewalks that are located to the south of the project site. The applicant is also required to do some restriping on Montoya Drive uh, in front of the project site. The applicant is being conditioned to shorten the existing southbound left turn pocket on Montoya to accommodate a two-way left turn lane on Montoya and directly in front of the new project entrance on Montoya. The applications that are being reviewed tonight are solely to facilitate the subdivision of, of the two parcels. Currently, the applicant is not ready to construct the homes yet. When that time comes, those will be presented before you under separate applications in the future. And that concludes my presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before the public hearing is open, do any of the commissioners have any questions for staff? Uh, Ms. Yang, a, a question on the, if you could bring up the graphic that shows the uh, lot map reference for the five that has the right of way triangle on it at the bottom. Okay, I'll just ask questions. Is that um, owner? Who is ownership of that land? In noting in the application packet, uh, the condition improves uh, sidewalks. What else happens to that triangle of land at the far south end? There? Uh, good evening. Uh, the piece of property on the thin section between Lincoln and Waterfall. The portion of the property where the tentative track map extends to from Cajon Drive up to High Grove is owned by the developer. The piece of property from High Grove south to where Lincoln merges back in together, that piece of property is owned by the city of Corona. The way the city acquired the piece of property was when, um, when Lincoln Avenue previously extended down uh, what we call Waterfall Lane. That's where the, 
the old lot lines extended from. So the property on High Grove extended all the way over to Waterfall. So when we bought the portion of Lincoln Avenue, we were also bought the small sliver of property that was left over. So the city owns that in fee. And the improvements. <laughs> Obviously, the developer, when he builds his five homes, he is required to do the improvements fronting his street, both on Waterfall and on Lincoln, including sidewalk, parkways, etc. We are also requesting developer construct the sidewalk along Lincoln Avenue and Waterfall around the Knuckle, and we would give him fee credits off the South Corona street fees for doing that work. Since that section is missing, and if we finish the rest off, we might as well complete the sidewalks. And the land in between the sidewalks would be landscaped? Yes, that would be landscaped, and he would get appropriate credit for that also. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I've uh, got one question. Uh, Ms. Yang, on the uh, track map, the uh, properties to the west of the subject property, are those the correct, uh, is that the correct alignment of uh, Lots. It seems like you know, on the aerial photo. The, I think the aerial showed it better. Yeah, the homes are facing north and south. There you, uh, can I answer that? The properties on Waterfall and Stillwater and those streets, when you look at the underlying lots, they don't line up with the way the ortho photos are drawn. There was an old track map that created small lots. When the developer built those lots, he merged multiple lots together and built these homes. Uh, I've never been able to find uh, a map that rededicated these lots. So each property owner owns multiple lots or a portion of a lot that was done for the rest of that track. That's why those lots are bigger than what's actually on the legal for those lots. I have a question regarding the uh, <clears throat> the east the east lot. Uh, and it was, goes back to the a part uh, a parcel sizes. Um, my question is, maybe I have the information wrong here, but the average size lot that is being proposed is eight thousand two hundred twenty one square feet. That seems as though it's smaller than the existing homes that are just north. Is that correct? The existing homes to the north are also zoned the same, so they would have similar lot sizes. We didn't calculate the average for that track, but um, they would have similar size zone, similar size lots. Yeah, they, they, I have. Um, I think you mentioned a, um, a seventy-two oh eight being the small up to twelve thousand six eighty, the larger, and I don't recall seeing the proposed homes have anything close to twelve thousand. I think it's the largest. Lot was around nine thousand. Well, maybe it was ten. I'm not sure. I had to go back on the my notes, but um, uh, you just count, just uh, you just went to the to the minimum, which is uh, the standard of a, a, a seventy two hundred. The lot range that I spoke of refers to the proposal, not the lot to the north. Okay. I did have a question while you have this one up. So the homes, um, actually, could you go back to the aerial of this one, please? Uh, no, there, there you go. So for uh, the existing 2601 and 2620, when the Macbeth and the, is it uh, Dakin, uh, Dakin uh, streets are lengthened and completed to complete the track, the lot there, what happens on that line there? Okay, I can answer that one. When the track to the north was developed, always it was always the plan that it would be extended in this configuration as shown now. The developer, because the fire department needed 
a turnaround. That street that you see in the ortho, that is really just an emergency access easement and drainage easement. So once the developer builds these streets, he will tear out the asphalt and build two more homes where that street is. If you look, it is lined up as a street, as a lot. So once he finishes it off, he'll build two homes where the street is and tear out the asphalt and finish the improvements down to the existing homes. So where it shows lot 12 and lot 19, that's the same as 2601 and 2620? No. 12 and, nine, 12 and 19 are in his development. He also owns the two lots that are labeled the addresses that you can see. So it's 25 homes, not 23 homes. It's, he's subdividing creating 23 homes, but ultimately, since he owns the two lots that are, he will build 25 homes. Got it. Okay. The, the, the two that. additional lots will be a part of a separate application. No, I believe those are existing legal lots, and he's entitled to build on them. I assume he'll include them in the precise plan when he builds these homes, but I think they're outside of this subdivision. And Ms. Coletta can correct me if I'm wrong on that. They are outside of the subdivision. Those two lots are not part of this project. Okay. I just wanted to know what was going to happen with those lots. Okay, thank you. Uh, I did have a question or I guess a comment uh, going back to the other smaller parcel. Um, I did a few little calculations using Google Earth to measure out some of the uh, existing lots in that area, of, uh, probably looking just across on the west side of Waterfall Lane. And I'm coming up with uh, average lot size around 12,000 square feet. And I know that uh, these five parcels are all below, like about 10,000 square feet and below. So um, just, you know, talking about uh, trying to match the the uh, nature of the existing uh, neighborhood. You know, they're, they are smaller lots, so it's something that, it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, not so sure about my calculations, but that's what I'm coming out with. And I think you're right. We're gonna hear from the open up public comment here in a little bit after we're done with our questions and we'll be hearing about that also. Mr. Hook, did you have more questions? I was on the same page. Okay. All right, if there's no other Questions for staff, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Let me go ahead and open up public comment. I have uh, four cards right now. Uh, Dave and Charles and Melina and Antonio, come on down. Or the price is right, so. <laughs> Good evening. Hello, uh, I'm Charles Grimsley. I'm here with my wife, Margarita, and we have the home on the corner of Waterfall Lane and Cajon that backs up to Lincoln. Uh, I think most of our questions or interest is in what is actually gonna be built there since we don't know we, that, what that is gonna be exactly like yet. Uh, we were concerned about the size of the lots, though, because these, these are going to be smaller lots that might not be congruous with the rest of the homes in the area. Uh, I don't know how to address that other than that this is something that we're thinking about. Uh, another concern that we have is how these are going to impact um, our view and our privacy, since uh, we do have a very nice view of the uh, mountains from where we are. And we know that there's going to be some impact. We're just hoping that that will be minimized. Uh, also, the privacy we have in our backyard is, is really wonderful. Uh, and so we're hoping that the home that's built there on the corner of uh, the proposed home on the corner of Waterfall and Cajon will not have a major view towards the north. 
Um, that, that's our concern. Uh, if, I, if there's any comment on that. Uh, I think we will go ahead and take all the uh, speaker cards, sir. I'm kind of taking notes. Uh, and the applicant uh, could address your questions as far as what uh, he thinks is going to come forward with a price precise plan, mm -hmm. which is down the road. Right. Um, but while I have you here, uh, walking the neighborhood, you have a unique size lot. Yeah. What's the history on that? Uh, well, I can't really tell you. We've only had the house for two years. Uh, we know the previous owners uh, uh, had made a lot of improvements on it. Other than that, uh, we we really don't know anything about the, the property. And I, and I do apologize for not uh, meeting you with you when you came by today. We were in the backyard and didn't hear you at the door, and I wish we'd have had a chance to talk with you. That would have been nice. Uh, no worries. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you for coming down. Thank you for letting me uh, have some comments. My name is Dave Welfel, and I, work, I live in the track right to the north of the larger parcel there on Dakin Drive. And I just have a couple of com comments regarding changing the zoning from agriculture to residential. It's probably too late now, but I wish the city had preserved more of its agriculture and preserved some of its heritage, but that has passed for most of the city. And, and of course, I will go along with what the commission recommends. But regarding the development, living on Dakin, uh, I hope that they don't allow the construction trucks to drive in through the neighborhood, through Macbeth and Dakin, uh, in, while they're building this. And I, I hope that they, they go in off of Montoya onto that A Street. And um, that was a concern that um, I was wondering if you had an exit onto Montoya. And um, it looks like there is, because we wouldn't want people commuting down through our neighborhood to get onto uh, Lincoln or you know to go down Montoya, so um, just to keep the traffic construction traffic out of our neighborhood, and um, of course we're going to lose our view too. But uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, thank you for letting me speak as well. Um, my name is Antonio Spinoza. I'm on Stillwater, adjacent right to the next, the smaller lot size uh, that they are constructing. Um, my uh, concerns were in regards to Mr. Tim Jones' uh, comments in regards to the lot sizes compared to the other homes. He is accurate on that. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the lot sizes will be way smaller compared to the other homes. It, I feel it would really affect our our uh, overall look of our, like our homes, it would be like, it, it would look way smaller than, the, like more crammed than the, well, the other homes around there. Um, I had a representative from the city come out to my home yesterday and she was walking around and asking uh, what we felt about the new construction. She recommended uh, uh, that we're looking into possibly maybe making only three or four uh, lots approved with maybe a park or dog park next to it to kind of improve the whole community. Well, that uh, would have been me. Oh. Wasn't recommending, but I was okay. sharing what your yeah. other neighbors are okay. also. I didn't recognize you it. without you know, your <laughs> attire. But I, I also I did agree to that. Um, and we hope that does maybe help um, make the, the, the environment look a little bit more better our home and um, that's just my concerns, and I do appreciate you coming to my home. It was nice to meet you, and nice uh, you thank you for coming down. No, thank you. All right, last one. Uh, your show is Melina. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, we live next to the, uh, what's it called, this construction site soon. So uh, my concern is that um, we have an elderly at home, so... Uh, she she is ninety five years old, so uh, we're just concerned about the uh, what they call this the the dust and the the noise at night and something like that. So are you closer to the bigger six the bigger acres yeah. or the okay? The, yeah, we're on the end of Macbeth. Okay. Yeah. 
We'll uh, ask the applicant to talk about the construction process and um, what mitigating measures there would be to keep dust down, that sort of thing. Because our elderly has allergies and she's very sick, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I have uh, Scott Nichols and Jerry and Mr. Richens. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Scott Nichols. I live at 2630 Galisteo Street. We back up to uh, Montoya, so I'm right at Montoya and um, Cadiz, if you're looking on the maps. Um, my questions, I have three. Uh, one is about also about the construction process, so if we could get some clarification on timing of the construction. I understand that the the what's being built isn't known yet, but I'd like to find out when it when the start times are, when the end times are, the projected start and end of construction, as well as the time of day for construction, and which days of the week. If it's going to be seven days a week or five days a week, I'd like to get information on that. Second uh, point is about the um, sidewalks. You guys were asking about the sidewalks earlier. On the other side, I'd like to know what's going to happen on the bigger property, on the six-acre property if there's gonna be sidewalks along Montoya, Lincoln, and Highgrove, uh, because that is not, uh, there's no sidewalks there, it's all just dirt, it used to be an orange grove. Um, and then my final question and concern, my biggest concern is about the uh, ingress and egress off of Montoya onto that street that's gonna be new, uh, right there next to Lincoln. Uh, I was wondering if a traffic study has been done there. We've got a lot of people speeding down that street. I'm sure the people that live on Dakin hear that just as much as I do. Um, and uh, I have concerns about accidents happening at that location. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Tom Richens, 1031 East Grand Boulevard. I. I'm glad, I'm curious to see how this plays out in front of you for tonight. The, uh, it's no secret here in Corona that developers are, in fact, developers in any city are going to try to build as much as they can and build asking for smaller lots, build more houses, make more money. And that's great for them, good for them. But that's not good for Corona. And, the, and by far and away, we have been abused in our city by developers pushing smaller houses, smaller lots, jam-packed housing. There's a precedent. There's a zone just to the north that you guys have been speaking about. That zoning, this zoning, needs to match that zoning. Those houses need to match these houses that are being built. We have rules and we have standards and we have a master plan. There's no reason why in our planning, if we're going to go from agriculture to what this property is now, to match the exact same housing track next to it. That, that's the rhyme and reason, that's the smartness. Right now what I see is a developer bullying the city. And I see a developer here tonight to try and bully you guys. So I'm hoping the four of you will put an end to it. You have the power to tell this developer, stop, go back to the city, match the zoning to the north. That's it, how it was planned out. You see the lots where, where the road cuts across you could tell it was meant to be extended. It wasn't meant to be extended at a different zoning. It was meant to be extended at the current zoning. So this is where we stop. You guys are the defense. And I'm hoping, and I, I have friends in this neighborhood. The Steinmeyers are here. They're, they're here to look at it. My mother lives just down the street. This is the time where you guys get to protect the citizens, not the developers. The city's taking care of them. So secondly, here's a thought that I'm hoping the citizens will take into consideration. This is an old agricultural field filled with mice and rodents. And the second construction breaks, just like we know from all the other developments in the city, those little animals, those little critters go running. They have to go running somewhere and they're going into your guys' houses. And we also know during construction, water pressure changes. Expect slab leaks. Expect expect the water changes to your house. It's going to happen. Those are kind of the evils that go with construction. But if we're going to ask the citizens to endure that, we can ask the citizens to get, at least give them a nice a nice look for look, not jam packed housing by a developer that's just looking for profits. Thank you. Thank you. 
And Jerry? Hi. Hi. Comments. Uh, my name is Jerry Castillo, born and raised Corona. Uh, it's a shame that our uh, character and our um, footprint of the city is going away. The, the groves that were on the corner were fantastic. It's probably the only area that really had groves in the town. I mean, we lost the Corona Library. That was an icon. Um, sad to see. Anyway, my cons I live west of the small development. Um, the idea earlier about three lots and a dog park is fantastic. My lot's over 14,000 square feet. We all have RV access on Bridgeport Road and a lot of the other adjoining uh, streets there. So lot size is a major concern. Uh, my other concern is also matching the existing product, masonry veneers, perimeter block walls, landscaping. Those are all my concerns as well. Uh, traffic coming down Lincoln, people love to speed. They're always going down Lincoln and up Lincoln, and they're going at excessive speeds. I've called the Corona Police several times. I've written emails to the Corona PD. A traffic signal could be an idea, possibly, coming uh, through that little uh, development. Just north of that small development would be an ideal uh, location for a traffic signal. Any idea when construction is scheduled to begin? Uh, we haven't heard. We don't have a precise plan in front of us, so that'll come back to us later. Okay. All right. Good. Because construction traffic, obviously, street sweeping and, and all that type of stuff will be a concern as well. And um, anyway, those are my comments. Thank you for coming down. Is there anyone else that wants to speak? That was my last speaker card. All right. I'll go ahead and close public hearing and bring it back to the dais. Gentlemen. I don't have any questions at this time. Uh, like for is the uh, developer, the uh, applicant here. Okay. Anyone else have any other comments? Go ahead. Uh, just some just staff question to either Miss Yang or to Tom. Um, within the conditions of approval, and, and looking through that, um, how is the plan to regulate construction traffic? I don't necessarily see that in the list of. A already developed housing area next to this new development. How would that be addressed normally? Normally, we do not condition the track versus construction traffic, but we highly recommend that we you separate construction traffic from the residential traffic. So, my opinion when when they do this. It's difficult because it's one access off of Montoya Drive. You also, the existing homes, we would not want construction traffic coming up through the existing homes. So I believe that the construction traffic will come in off Montoya. They'll branch around so that you can start building in and phase it as you come through without mixing the construction traffic and the residential traffic. So... We would not permit them to use the Macbeth and the other Dakin to bring the construction traffic up through there. We'd want them to come through Montoya, which means that all the residential would come up through the existing homes as they move in. But I assume the developer also would want his model homes off of Montoya so that he can get the greatest visibility for them. So it's a tough site to work that out. But we will make sure they don't mix them. So you addressed Montoya, but uh, what about the uh, 36605, the little lot? Those two lots cannot be developed until the street is built through and there's appropriate fire, emergency, second point of access. So... My envisioning of that was that once the development is built, those would be the two last homes built. And yes, because they'd be the last ones built, they would have to, there would be some construction traffic adjacent to the existing homes. You can't build it right next to it without having the traffic there. Because they wouldn't be able to use that little uh, sliver of city property to the south? Uh, are we talking about the maybe? five lots or the 26 lots? No, the other side, the five. Five lots. 
Well, obviously, we would not, if all the construction traffic would come in off waterfall because we're not going to allow staging to come off of Lincoln because that's too busy of a street. So they'd have to fence it off and work from the inside of the project. But the residents out there would experience some impacts while they're building the street, the sidewalks and that. Yes. So the site would be self-sufficient then? Yes, pretty much. There'll still be a little bit of an impact, but it won't be that bad. Okay, and that was some of the questions that came up when uh, I went knocking on doors was the construction, when it starts, will it affect the water and electricity of the track just north of the six-acre lot? No. Uh, the water pressure will not be impacted by the development. It's static pressure. It's based on the elevation of the reservoir and the elevation of the homes. So whatever these guys, whatever the development does, it will not impact the water. In fact, it'll probably make it better because it'll loop it around. It'll have a loop system instead of two long dead ends. So uh, it, the water will not be impacted. The other question they asked is, yes, this development will build sidewalks on Lincoln, on High Grove, and Montoya. So they will complete the uh, sidewalks around the project. Okay, thanks. And for the um, young lady who was asking regarding the dust and uh, elderly patient at home, um, the condition of approval, uh, that's all monitored on site uh, daily, and they have requirements for construction dates. It's all part of the conditions of approval that we'll see uh, coming through on the precise, or is it here today with our conditions? We that have? is part of our grading permit. For, grading. For, you know, they're going to have to keep the site clean they're gonna to have to spray water but it is a construction site and there you can't keep it perfectly spotless but if there's dust leaving the site and wind our inspectors will enforce that and make sure it's appropriately watered down okay thank you and Ms. Yang uh, it ref the the uh, staff report refers to this study the traffic study but I didn't see an attachment we normally don't attach a traffic study to staff reports, but yes, one was done, and it's discussed in in the um, MND as well as the staff reports. Correct. I read about it, but didn't see it attached. I thought I was just missing something. And we did review the traffic study. Uh, a signal at Cajon is not warranted, uh, and this intersection in Montoya does not need a signal. The level of service for these intersections is a B, so... Uh, we do not need any more mitigation on those sites. Okay. Um, regarding uh, knocking on doors and, and reaching out to the community, uh, quite a bit of feedback, and this is uh, directed to the applicant probably. So maybe I'll wait until after the applicant comes forward. Could we ask the applicant to come forward? Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Dennis Armstrong. I'm with Armstrong and Brooks Consulting Engineers. We're at 1350 East Chase Drive in Corona, and we're the civil engineer for the applicant. Did you have a question, Mr. Jones? Uh, yes. I, sir, can you give us, uh, I know this um, uh, plan has been kind of a long time coming, and can you give us a little background on how uh, probably more specifically on the uh, west side, the, the smaller lot. Um, you have five parcels there uh, um, that you're proposing. One of them is requiring a variance. Can you give us some uh, background on how that came about? Uh, sure. So we're proposing to match the zoning to the north on the north side of Cajon. The properties within the uh, Stillwater and Waterfall development 
they're fronting the streets on the north and south side. We are, we're separated by the old alignment of Lincoln Avenue. And the variance is being requested because of the realignment of Lincoln Avenue that used to be a straight shot north-south. And with the curvilinear realignment, it pinches off that southerly corner quite substantially. The most northerly property line on the lot requesting the variance does meet the depth requirements, but the city's definition of a lot depth takes into account the mean of the side property lines. And therefore, we're just short of that requirement. And so your, your largest lot is 10,000, I think it's 10,070 square feet, uh, some, somewhere in there. Um, and a lot that, that neighborhood, which I'm looking at this point to the west, those houses will be facing the west. So I kind of, this is just my opinion, I'm considering mm -hmm. this as a part of that neighborhood. Uh, those homes to the west are quite a bit larger. Um, do, do you, would you happen to know the square footages of the residences that are built within that neighborhood? Um, the only square footage that was shared with me was the north side on Waterfall, over 3,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the lot sizes, someone alluded to 14,000 square feet on there. I, I don't know how much of an impact that would have on an appraised value, but... It's my understanding the developer will be building homes consistent in square footage with what exists in those neighborhoods. Okay, and what about the uh, size of the lot, which also plays a part in uh, you know, the neighborhood? Uh, yeah, it's, it's consistent with the properties to the south and also to the north and to the east. And then there is the street that separates the two developments. Okay, I understand that, but I guess the point I'm making is it's not consistent with the properties to, directly to the west, which are the, probably the closest and most prominent from the front of those homes. Right, but at, at some point you're going to have to have a line of demarcation, and the layout is consistent with the surrounding zonings. Actually, I'm going to uh, beg to differ with you. The... The lots to the west are significant. Um, if you put up the uh, aerial, please, of this lot. Nope. There, that's the one. Thank you. Um, so looking at almost four-fifths of that parcel that's uh, outlined in blue, four-fifths is, is only two of those lots of those houses there. So the majority of that lot with existing Homes is not seven two. It's actually much larger, and that faces the neighborhood directly across the street from them. So it's not consistent, in my opinion. When I walked the residences, they were surprisingly unanimous about the five homes at this lot not working with the neighborhood. It's not consistent, and the size of those lots they bought them for a reason. And that is to enjoy the larger lot. And they've been there for 20 plus years. And what are the lots to the north of Cajon? I walk those also. They, uh, they, don't, want, they don't want five homes on that lot. And that was no. unanimous from what I heard. I, I understand um, what the neighbors are saying. But I was just asking the question about the lots to the north of Cajon along Waterfall. Uh, let's see what they were telling me. Would staff be able to answer that, Sandra? Are you referring to the lot size? Yes. There are about 7,200 square feet to about 6,000. With the 6,000 approximately, with that one would be the very corner lot. That's the biggest one. And the big one's the exception on the corner there, mm -hmm. Sandra, Cajon yes. and uh, Waterfall. Correct. The smaller lots, as you go north along Waterfall, the lots get smaller. Right, because that strip gets smaller down there, up, up there towards the top. Which is a similar situation that we have to the south. 
I asked uh, along the same line, uh, looking at Shady Mill and Stillwater, uh, addresses 1143, 1133, 1123, all of those lots, what sizes are those roughly? All the lots that are in, all the lots within the, those older homes that are built in the 80s along Shady Mill and everything, they're about 11,700 square feet. The end lots that face like Oak Avenue and Waterfall, they're slightly larger. Those end lots are about 9,600 square feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Hooks, do you have some? Well, I, I think the lot size is going to dictate the size of the home. I know this little early, but it would be really nice to have a snapshot of the planned home size that is being um, um, that's specified for that part, a parcel. Um, so I guess the next time around we're going to have to have to visit that. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the lot size for now, I'm assuming that the lot size have a was designed or created on a size with a size of a house in mind. Is that is that is that correct or? Um, I can't answer that directly, yeah. but if you mm -hmm. take a, an 80 foot wide lot mm -hmm. and you have a 10 and a five foot setback, you would have a 65 foot building envelope to play with and they're 100 feet deep. So you could have a building footprint right up there. to 3,500 for a single story home. And if you go two stories, you could have a 2,000 square foot footprint and have approximately 4,000 square feet. So the square footages are going to be consistent with the existing development to the west. And, and when a properties are appraised, it's a lot of times based on cost per square footage, not necessarily lot size. Well, when you have smaller lots, you would happen is typically you have uh, a masses increase in the neighborhood. So I think uh, lot size does play a play a role in my opinion. That's all I have. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, a uh, question. So the, the variance that you're applying for for the fifth lot, what other alternatives did you look at within this parcel we looked other at, than asking for a variance? Yeah, we looked at orienting the lot in a north-south manner, and that was not supported by staff. We, we looked at eliminating a portion of the CFD lot along Lincoln and granting that as an easement, and that was not supported by staff. Looking at the application for um, 36608, I understand, I understand that. That makes sense to me. Uh, it, it makes sense that that Macbeth and um, Duncan is supposed to follow through in the home, that track being completed. Uh, I like the ingress and egress on Montoya and the improvements for that, um, helping the traffic circulation. This 36605, I have a problem with. I would not be in favor of granting a variance for that fifth lot. I think this calls for three to four homes. Um, I would be in favor of uh, continuing that and see what the applicant can come back with for larger lots, three to four homes on there, and possibly come up with some uh, park, uh, dog park uh, discussion with the city, something uh, of that nature, and maybe combine it with the city's uh, right away on the south end there. Those are my two cents. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, that my feeling, this is my feeling, is that uh, those lots on that uh, uh, 1.4 acre lot, uh, uh, parcel should be roughly 12,000 square feet. Uh, what we have, and I understand to the north, they're a little smaller, uh, but to the west, which is the majority of this neighborhood, uh, we've got 
pretty large lots with RV access, and not, not that these have to have that, but I, I do think the lot size matters. Um, I'd like to see personally something along the lines of uh, maybe adding an extra 10 feet to the width of the lots, redu take, taking out that fifth lot, maybe going with four lots, something like that, and then, you know, like, like the uh, uh, chair said, uh, maybe having some kind of a public public use uh, created out of the, uh, the remainder of that uh, vacant land. Oh, I had one more thing, um, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, walking the neighborhood and knocking on doors, big concern was the elevated grading that's already existing there um, for the applicant. Um, it creates a hazard to be able to see the north-south uh, traffic on Lincoln as you come out of Cajon uh, to try and make a turn, and especially it's difficult during uh, commute time mornings and evenings. Um, would that elevation, maybe Mr. Cobert could also talk about that, could the elevation be dropped down so it's not such a safety hazard? And the other part, would I would think, is if you could drop back that one lot uh, X number of feet so there is that visible uh, on a high traffic area. I, those are just some of my comments. Uh, after talking to the residents, I also um, spoke to uh, Mr. Scrump, a Shady Mill uh, resident, and he talks about the... Um, the history of Lincoln and the, the alignment where it is today and where it was uh, and the driving habits that have um, forced the residents to pick other driving habits because of the high traffic getting out onto Lincoln. Uh, I called the PD and got some traffic numbers. Uh, Lincoln and High Grove, there were four accidents since last summer, uh, two non-injury, one uh, injury, one heavy rescue. And as far as Cajon and Lincoln, um, there was uh, comments made about what a hazard it was. There were no traffic collisions for that. Uh, as far as traffic stops, PD is aware of it. They are um, pulled over eight uh, traffic stops at Lincoln and High Grove, so they're aware of it. They're out in the area with nothing at Cajon and Lincoln. I spoke to uh, Aaron Cox, uh, traffic engineering, and um, it was brought to his attention as far as the uh, traffic conditions on Stillwater and Shady Mill and uh, the speeds on those residential tracks and have uh, he's put up a uh, LED traffic um, equipment that is a reminder of high speed. He's also working with Mr. Scrump to come up with some measures to mitigate. So for the neighbors uh, in the audience, um, there's only a few of these uh, LED um, e traffic uh, equipment pieces. They're very expensive. So uh, uh, Stillwater and Shady Mill are on the waiting list uh, for that equipment to help remind people to slow down on those residential. And I guess they really take off as they get out onto Lincoln Avenue. So I wanted to include that um, as part of my reporting. Um, any other comments? Yeah, I, maybe it's to, to you, Mr. Roper. Um, so the parcel in question is owned by the developer. We have a city right of way that is just sitting there. Uh, yes, we in our conditions we would ask to for the developer to add a sidewalk. What other options do we have with that land that haven't been discussed? I heard the applicant uh, mention an easement that was discussed and denied. Okay. Are there other, other options that could be entertained here that have not been? besides denying the application or reducing the number of homes, whatever, what, what else is available? We have a minimum requirement along Lincoln Avenue for the community facilities district. We cannot or should not allow the developer to include that in an easement to minimize or maximize their lot. We want to keep the nice wide parkway down Lincoln Avenue. The piece of property that the city owns in fee, realize we own it. Uh, for us to decide what we're going to do with it, whether it be a dog park or a passive park, that's really something that should be discussed in the Parks Commission. Uh, and besides, we own it in fee. We can't, uh, it'd be difficult. You'd have to, you don't want to give it away. You can't give it away without just compensation for the city, whether it be 
less maintenance or the developer pays for it. But if we build a dog park, the developer is going to be compensated for, in my opinion, for building the park because it's city property. Uh, and then we got to deal with how we're going to maintain it, which are really questions that should be addressed by the uh, Parks Commission. I hope I hope that's clear. Somewhat, yes, I understand the answer, your answer, but I think it still says we've got four applications, and yeah, if, if I need they're to, not all the same. So, <laughs> if I can provide some guidance a little bit here, I just my job is just to tell you what's currently the situation and what the land use law is. So, can we put up the locational map, please, rural, so we can have a visual of what it's currently right now. Keep going. There you go. Go back. So this is this is the situation you have before you. The property that you're talking about, which is the smaller piece, is already zoned R17.2. He's not asking you to change the zoning of that parcel. Therefore, he has tried to design it to meet the criteria of those zones. However, in addition to that, he has come before you with a variance because he says he needs a deviation from the development standard. So really the option before this commission this evening is whether or not you want to support that variance. If you don't want to support that variance, then it pushes him to go back and look at the project, what basically comes down to four lots. But to dictate that he do something substantially larger than what the zoning allows is going to get a little tricky because we've already entitled it for R17.2. Um, looking at the map, all of the lots are well above 8,000. But again, if you're not going to support the variance because you want all the lots to adhere, then you've pushed him down to four lots, and that's what he's got to come back with. So you're dealing with four lots as opposed to five. Ms. Kleiner, but what we could do is, since it's four applications, two tentative track maps. If we're favorable for the one track map with the um, zone change, it wouldn't affect the other two. That is correct. They're all separate um, actions. So you can definitely um, decide which ones you want to move forward on and which ones you would like to reserve. Um, just so you know, if just let me know when you get down to the variance. I'll listen to the discussion so I can provide some additional guidance on that as well. Okay, thank you. Excuse me for a second. Go um, ahead. If if the um, developer is required to go down to the four lots because a variance is denied, I can't guarantee that the lots shown are going to be any larger because we will need to take up additional space to get to the required lot depth for that most southerly lot. I understand that. Mr. Armstrong, Would um, what I would like to be message brought back to the applicant is to consider maybe uh, rezoning it so that the three lots could fit if there were a discussion of three and if there was any discussion with the city as to what, uh, would, what would the makeup uh, would be for the rest of the area. Um, and perhaps bring something to the Parks Commission. I don't even know if that's a consideration on the applicant's part. I can tell you the development standards do not change if you go to a larger lot size. The depth is still going to be 100 feet. Um, that is a standard in a typical R1 zone. So he's not, he's not going to gain anything by going 8.4 or 9.6. It's still 100 foot depth. Okay, thank you. But you make up the size with the width if you're chasing the size, right? Right. Yeah, I, I see it as being a sort of a geometrical balancing act between width to get larger lot size versus not going too far to the south uh, to where you're now not getting your 100-foot depth. Um, I understand that a part, it looks like a part of that parcel may not get developed at all. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Um, but I, I personally can't support a, a variance for, for this particular situation. That's my feelings because uh, I, I, don't, I just don't see the hardship there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hooks, anything? No? There's just a second one. 
Uh, my only comment is we have four applications. Yes, they are tied together, but they are distinctly different. And I, I kind of feel like we should move forward, move forward and analyze them on their own standing. Okay, sounds good. Um, well, then I'll entertain a motion for the first item, uh, which is the rezoning for the 36608 parcel. Uh, do we have a motion for CZ 16-002? The zoning would be changing it from agricultural to. Uh, that's the six acres. That's the 23 lot, six acres, correct. Did you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, move that the Planning and Housing Commission recommend adoption of the mitigated neck deck and mitigation monitoring plan and approval of CZ 16-002 for the City Council based on the findings contained in the staff report. Okay, I have a motion. Can I have a second? I'll second. And a second. Please vote. All right, that zone change is approved 4-0. And the second part of this would be for the tentative track map, the larger parcel, six acres, so 36608. May I have a motion for approval? Uh, I would motion to approve tentative track map 36608. Although not a added condition, I would like to note that our discussion regarding the construction management activities be updated in the condition of approval. Uh, oh. the, the flow through the existing homes that was discussed. Okay. You can definitely add a condition that construction traffic not use residential streets. We, it's sure. a given, yeah. but yeah. we've Let's done it. Let's add that language then if Absolutely. that's the easiest approach, that construction language not access the existing housing development. And then we can also implement a vector control plan prior to grading as well. Okay, with those two conditions, with vector control and construction management flow, I have a motion. Could I have a second, please? I'll second. Second. All right, I'll go with Mr. Jones for a second. Please vote. You have to be quicker. All right, tentative track map with those two conditions passes, 4-0. All right, we're moving down to the variance. Um, need a motion for V2019-001. Is it? Madam Chair. Uh, there we go, wrong way. Start back up a little bit. I need a motion for tentative track map 36605. I'm sorry, this is not placed on the agenda correctly. It does need to be the variance first. First, it does, okay. So we'll go out of order to item D. I need a motion for V2019-001. Um, I'd like some guidance. Uh, are options to approve, deny, or can we propose a continuance if, if that's okay with, uh, with the applicant? I mean, what do we... Well, we don't need uh, approval for a continuance from the applicant. Uh, if you wanted to continue it, and have it come back for our next meeting if that's enough time. See if the applicant wants to come back with something different for the tentative track map. Is that correct, Ms. Coletta? Yeah, so if you want to continue it to see if, what other design he could come up with, you can definitely do that. Uh, if the decision is not to do that, then you're directing staff to come back with a resolution of denial on the variance. And we would need to know the reasons for, we would need to hear some of your reasons so we can implement that into the findings. But um, yeah, uh, continuance to evaluate something other than what's not here tonight would need to be voted on. Is that where you wanna go, that direction? I'd like to move to continue. All right, well, I have a motion for a continuance on. How do you guys feel about it? He's got the dais. 
I, I'm definitely in favor of continuing until we can see a plan B for this. All right, so I have a motion for continuance on V2019-001. And is that a second, Mr. Hooks? I'll second that. And can we get it to a date certain so we don't have to re-advertise? Absolutely. Did you think two weeks is enough for the applicant to come back? Well, I'm going to talk for staff because we're on a deadline, and since we have to evaluate it, it would have to be April 6th. April 6th, and I'm okay with April 6th if, so I'm, if staff's I'm okay, with, okay with it. All right, so a continuation. I have a motion, and Mr. Hooks has a second. No second. Please vote. I'm sorry, who was the motion? Uh, Mr. Jones, and the second was Mr. Hooks. So a yes would be a continuance at this point. All right, uh, approval for a continuance for zero on the variance. And now we're to tentative track map 36605. Can we also have a motion for a continuance if that's your desire? Mr. Jones, would you like to continue the tentative track map also? Yes, I would. All right. And April 6th is a good date. Yes. To include on there? I agree with that. Mr. Hooks, you want to second that? I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second for a continuance on TTM 36605. Please vote. And that also passes 4-0. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you. All right. Thank you to everyone that came down and spoke to us tonight and uh, spoke to me while I was out knocking on doors, I appreciated your input. All right, we're at item, agenda item number seven, written communications. Have we received any written communications? No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Having none, administrative report, Ms. Coletta? No. And none, and planning and housing commissioner reports and or comments, anyone? None. None for tonight, all right, well then we're adjourning until March 23rd, thank you.